talking about response to economic shocks here today, and um, I'm I'm focusing upon um, one of the most uh, egregious um, uh, economic shocks that uh, has been experienced in modern times, which is the global financial crisis um, that started in the United States and uh, spread uh, in one way or another um, across several continents. Um, and uh, I'm interested in, in the question of you know, how, do, how do less developed countries um, uh, react to that? Uh, what, can they, you know, what is the impact? How do they react to that? And perhaps that enables us to draw some wider lessons. I'm going to have, take a particular focus, the way that uh, different uh, uh, developing countries react um, uh, differs. Um, uh, the way that... Uh, a uh, developing country like China reacts is very different from the way that a poor country in sub-Saharan Africa reacts. So I'm going to focus upon um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa. <clears throat> the, um, uh, in talking about how, how do countries respond to crisis, um, the, the first issue is um, do, they, do they necessarily get affected by the crisis? And um, uh, in other words, you know, is it possible that they, they actually avoided the immediate effects of the, of the global financial crisis? Um, that sounds ludicrous, but I'll, refer, I'll come back to that in a moment, because the answer is that no, they didn't avoid the immediate effects of the crisis. What, what's a little bit more interesting is what happened afterwards. Did they recover from the, from the financial crisis? And there, the answer is typical economist's answer. On the one hand, yes. On the other hand, no. Um, they did recover directly. Um, their situation recovered. Um, but uh, indirectly, uh, no, their, their growth rates um, certainly suffered um, uh, over the longer term. And that's what I'm going to be focusing on here. <clears throat> did they... Did they suffer initially? Well, the reason I pose that question is because there was a hypothesis at the time of the financial crisis, immediately at the time of the Lehman's uh, crash, um, which, which crystallized the, the beginnings of the crisis. Um, there was a, a widespread view that, well, actually, you know, maybe countries like, like those in sub-Saharan Africa and maybe elsewhere in the developing world um, will avoid any effect from the crisis. Um, because, in other words, they become de-linked. Well, to see, just, uh, and around that time, there were you know, numerous studies, uh, numerous papers published to see, well, to what extent were they de-linked and to what extent are they linked? Um, the main thing that writers concentrated upon was, was the most obvious thing and to claim that they are delinked because their banking systems were not uh, integrated um, with the global uh, financial markets, the global financial system um, that had uh, uh, been um, at the centre uh, of the mechanisms through which the financial crisis occurred and was transmitted um, uh, around developed countries. Um, you know, the uh, banks in, in sub-Saharan Africa, banks elsewhere, you know, were not involved in, in you know, big, big uh, trades or any trades in some cases in complex uh, financial derivatives, which were the mechanism through which the uh, uh, prime, uh, prime, prime mortgage, uh, sorry, subprime mortgage um, uh, collapse was transmitted through, through the markets. It was transmitted through the markets because that subprime mortgage collapse um, uh, led to a complete breakdown of all the uh, financial market linkages between individual global banks um, and uh, uh, effectively a shutdown in the market, money markets that connect them. Uh, but the argument was that, well, in sub-Saharan Africa, or countries like that, um, the, the, the banks are, are sheltered from that. They're not involved in that. Um, kind of uh, trade, and that's true. Actually, a particular, an, an interesting 
um, example of that actually comes from sort of Islamic banks in in the Gulf and elsewhere, where several studies showed that actually they the Islamic banks you know were comp- were totally unaffected by the crisis and did really uh, outperformed all other banks during that period, um, simply because you know, being uh, following Islamic principles, they were not engaged in any kind of um, debt-based, um, let alone derivative-based um, uh, activities. Okay, so, yeah, in that sense, they were delinked. Um, uh, what about private capital flows? That was the other mechanism that people thought, well, perhaps private capital flows will link, them, link in sub-Saharan African um, countries into the uh, effects of the crisis. Um, because uh, a breakdown um, in, in, the, in, uh, in the financial system in developed countries um, would lead to a reduction in private capital flows. What about... Uh, well, in fact, um, the evidence on that is, is very mixed. And, uh, um, but when you look at the data, um, uh, there, there, there does not seem to have been overall a major impact on a reduction in private capital flows at that time. Um, although there were some short-term flows, which I'll, I'll say more about in a moment. What about ODA, uh, development assistance? They thought that as, as developed countries um, face financial problems, they would cut back on their ODA, their development assistance, and that would um, uh, hit the uh, sub-Saharan countries. Um, a lot of us felt that at the time. Well, uh, looking at it, um, ODA has held up pretty well, actually, until just... just the most recent couple of years when ODA has started to decline. Um, the other potential link um, that could affect things is trade, and people recognize that at the beginning. Um, there was immediately a fear that the breakdown of the financial system would um, um, bring an end to export financing, um, to uh, and, and that, or to trade financing generally, and that that would restrict trade. In fact, that's not what happened. Um, trade financing um, actually held up in general, although there is some mixed evidence on that. But nonetheless, trade did come to be a major transmission mechanism. Whoops. <clears throat> I hope you have very good eyesight. Um, uh, I, I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to do a lot about this. I don't think I'm going to be able to expand that unless anybody here can tell me how to. Um, but I'll tell you what it shows, okay? Um, basically, um, in sub-Saharan terms of trade. It's, so we're looking at the volume of exports and terms of trade. And um, the crisis, <coughs> uh, the financial crisis broke in a big way in 2008. Oh, terrific. Thanks a lot, yeah. The financial crisis broke in a big way in, in, in 2008, which is here, and which shows that in 2008 the you know, sub-Saharan exports um, uh, were lower than the previous year, but uh, had, held, had held up. Um, uh, they were still growing. Uh, sorry, the, their growth rate was lower than the previous year, but that held up. It was still growing at about 2%. Um, 2008, though, we have the immediate hit on sub-Saharan African exports, um, a decline of 5%. Um, so, and that was a major channel of transmission. That did hit all, all of sub-Saharan Africa um, and had effects right throughout their economies. Um, but what happened after that? Immediately, exports started to grow again in 2010. Um, uh, uh, a rise of uh, nearly 6%. So it's in that sense that, that I say that, you know, well, South Africa, sorry, not South Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa was immediately hit by um, the global financial crisis, but did recover very quickly. The same is true if you look at um, the terms of trade, the percentage change in the terms of trade facing sub-Saharan African countries. In, twen- in 2008, the, the terms of trade 
uh, sorry, that's 2009. In 2009, the terms of trade uh, took a 12% fall. Um, but again, they recovered completely in the following year. Yeah. But a 13% 13, 13 improvement in the terms of trade facing sub-Saharan Africa. So in that sense, we're saying that um, uh, sub-Saharan Africa was able to recover quite quickly. Um, uh, but what happened thereafter? Thereafter, we've had very slow rates of growth. 2011, 2% rates of growth of exports uh, and uh, a 10% improvement in the terms of trade, followed by... In 2012, 2013, 2014, 2015, um, a continuing year-on-year -year decline in terms of trade facing sub-Saharan Africa, uh, accompanied by very, very slow rates of growth um, in, uh, in exports. Okay, so, um, you know, in, in one sense... In, in one sense, then, um, actually, I'm going to have that back from you in a moment. In, in one sense, then, there was a, a, yeah, a sharp hit um, on trade uh, facing sub Saharan Africa, and that result, that, uh, uh, and a sharp worsening of the terms of trade, and that, that resulted from, directly from the global financial crisis. Why? Well, it, it resulted from the global financial crisis for several reasons, but you know one particular reason was that um, the, the developed countries um, had uh, the, 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 the sharp downturn was due to the developed countries finding that they that that every enterprise uh, wanted cash. Um, there was a sharp move into cash because financial markets had collapsed, and that meant they had to sell off inventories. There was a sharp reduction um, in inventories, um, which hit trade um, uh, completely, particularly for products of sub-Saharan Africa, which were which were products that um, we're measuring on this chart. Um, here we're seeing uh, global trade. Global trade took a 10% fall in 2009 and recovered quickly in 2010. Um, face, uh, but in t if we look at what was happening to the products of sub-Saharan Africa, we can see uh, commodity price index um, taking a fall from 172 to 120. In that period, and then recovering very quickly to 152, um, and particularly so if we look at things like commodity metals prices um, going from 169 to 136, and then the index recovering quickly to 202. And uh, we see that pattern all the way through a sharp decline in 2009, uh, followed by a sharp rise. So what do we? What kind of stylized facts can we uh, uh, pick out of all that? Well, the trade played a key role in the transmission to South, South the Sub-Saharan Africa of, of the global financial crisis, and that took the form of a sh major shock one year after the crisis, followed by a bounce immediately after the big bounce immediately afterwards. But in the subsequent years we've seen slow growth and we've seen slow slow growth of trade slow growth um, of all types you know, however we measure growth um, in sub-saharan africa is that a new normal and why does it arise well i think you know it's easy for us to think of it as being simply just you know a long decline. You know that we've had a big, a big shock, the global financial crisis, and then everything was was pretty bad thereafter. Um, 
It just couldn't start start a growth process either in global trade or or in the specifics of sub-Saharan Africa. Um, uh, but that's not really the case because, as we saw, immediately after the big shock hit those countries, there was a big upturn suddenly the next year, a recovery. There had been overshooting. Um, so what what generates the uh, overall uh, decline, uh, overall stagnation um, that Praveen Gordon referred to this morning um, in the subsequent years, in, 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 in the, the decade, really, since then? Well, I think it's basically um, that there are you know, very many new global imbalances and volatility which has restricted um, the, the drivers of international trade, which are the big industrialized countries, including major emerging countries like China and so on, um, and has restricted their, uh, their growth rates, and has created, a, a, and the crisis itself created an awareness of volatility, which has uh, uh, diminished the ability of countries to invest and grow. Um, uh, I can say more about that. Um, the second thing to note, though, is that um, there is now a new fragility because uh, I haven't put up here any figures relating to external debt, but it is clear that um, uh, several countries, particularly commodity producers, which experienced a boom before 2008, um, accumulated debt in that period, they borrowed a lot, they had a lot of inward investment, and also in the, in the period uh, immediately after 2011, um, when they were recovering, again, uh, there was an inflow of capital. Um, and that, that accumulation of debt issued by uh, um, uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa and other developing countries has put them in a position where they now have a very high degree of leverage. It was debt that came in because they were able to borrow at very low interest rates, and which was attractive to them. But more to the point, it was very attractive for, for portfolio owners and investors from, developing com from developed countries because the interest rates, the returns they could get in the United States, Europe, etc., were so low, they sought to be able to uh, lend in... Uh, poor countries, particularly commodity exporting countries. Um, of course, though, that means that once interest rates start to go up, there's a big danger that, uh, there's a very serious danger that those countries will be uh, in the midst of a, a, a major debt crisis again. Um, and um, now all that... What we're interested in is how can countries themselves respond? What's going to be the effect of a crisis? Can they, can they respond to it? Um, we'll be discussing that in many different facets this afternoon, but I'll just point to a few things. Basically, the issue is whether there is hysteresis. Hysteresis means that what happens in the future is very much determined by what's happened. Um, well, it seems obvious that it should be the case, but how would that occur? How would hysteresis occur? In my view, it sort of comes about through um, weakened institutions which limit and seriously, seriously um, undermine the ability of countries in sub-Saharan Africa to respond. One is simply what's called fiscal space, that um, you know, by uh, several countries, uh, such as South Africa, for example, um, did uh, uh, use uh, fiscal policy uh, increasing the size of the budget deficits um, in order to support their economy during the uh, initial phase of, of the downturn and so on. But that means that now they've accumulated debt externally and internally, which uh, limits the extent <coughs> to which they can continue to um, uh, prime their economies through budget deficits. That's one thing. <coughs> a second thing is, um, which I, I, I think is, is that's terrific, yeah. uh, is um, the second thing which I, 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 I think is, is, is uh, perhaps 
the most important is, is a breakdown in trust and inequality. You know, when there's a major hit, even if it's only a fairly short-term hit, such as in in, in 20, uh, as, as sub-Saharan African countries felt in 2009, 2010. Um, there's a breakdown in, in whatever social contract there is between uh, the elites and their governments on the one hand and civil society on the other hand, and an increase in inequality. It is the poor who feel the burdens of uh, any downturn and so on. And that is partly accompanied by you know, civil society fragmentation, um, which we've seen in many ways um, uh, in terms of sometimes internal conflict between uh, different groups within countries, um, sometimes um, uh, other forms of civil society fragmentation. Um, and those, those kinds of things make it very difficult for any sort of political um, uh, uh, leadership to be able to take a country forward. Um, and obviously encourages a kleptomaniac kind of um, action by... by uh, Elites that have got uh, access to rents, um, uh, which in turn has led to um, major um, capital flight from sub-Saharan Africa. A, a, a final element is simply that you know, with that that cut in fiscal space, that those fiscal restrictions on governments, um, uh, the inability of, of governments to expand their budget um, because they have already, had already expanded it is such that one of the sectors that gets really badly hit is investment in education. And even to the extent that education occurs, um, it uh, severely hits the ability to facilitate the transition from education into work. Hence, we get sort of large, um, you know, ever-increasing, uh, appears at the moment, ever-increasing um, bodies of unemployed uh, youth, perhaps a lost generation. Um, those feed into migration, about which I'll say nothing because um, uh, Andres is uh, the, the, one of the world's experts on migration. And, um, uh, but migration, clearly, um, uh, an immediate effect is that it's, it, it's caused by these weakened institution, institutions, it's caused by this weakening of the possibilities of growth, but at the same time, it limits the ability of countries to have uh, you know, new growth things, new entrepreneurial activities and so on, because um, uh, of the loss of um, uh, innovative uh, people who migrate. Okay, in other words, the crisis simply weakens the ability of countries to respond to the crises. W what's meant by that? Yep. yep. One moment. So, can I go to minus one? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So basically, the the um, you know the, there is there has in, in economics there's been a widespread view that you know, crises are cathartic and they are the pre precursor to developing new growth and so on. Um, ideas first put forward by Marx and Schumpeter. Um, could that happen in in sub-Saharan Africa? Well, from what I've said, the answer is no. I think no. It's not going to happen. Um, uh, how could it happen? Well, in principle, it could happen by a sort of well-worked-out state-led policy for economic diversification. Um, but from what I've said about the crisis weakening the institutional structure and the social cohesion um, of countries, um, that state-led policy for economic diversification is, is, seems to be way out of reach. Um, there's a body of work in, in, in economics called Finance for Development. And um, uh, in, in, in uh, the finance and development work, there's, there's a big view that, you know, there the are good studies, which I've, I've always uh, liked very much, that seem to show that, well, actually, if you have a strong financial, if you have a well-developed financial system, um, that enables you to recover from shocks because it enables people to be able to finance new enterprises and move from one industry to another um, and thereby generate a new kind of economic growth and so on. Um, in fact, that's, that's uh, not happening. Um, the, the financial systems in, in sub-Saharan Africa are not able to do that and I, I'm skeptical as to whether they ever can. 
Okay, so I have to leave you with the pessimistic note that I've overrun my time. Um, is, it un is my pessimism unjustified? Is it simply pessimism of the intellect and optimism of something else? Um, well, I'll leave you to decide that. Thank you very much, yeah. <laughs>